Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Truth and Journalism Conference. Um, we're about to start our second panel of the day, which is Accuracy and Verification Across Disciplines, moderated by Tara Williamson to my left. Um, and I'll let Tara take it away. <laughs> oh, look, oh, I can see you right in front of me. That's so helpful. Bonjour, um, Tanse, Tara Williamson, Dijna Kaz, Gavishkigamak, Gayo Pasquak, and Duljipa. My name is Tara Williamson. I'm a member of the Pasquak Cree Nation in Treaty um, 5. Uh, no, yeah, 5 in northern <laughs> Manitoba, because I'm also in, was raised in Treaty 1, and my dad is from Treaty 6 in Beardy's Okamasis. Um, I'm currently the co research director of the Indigenous Law Research Unit at the University of Victoria. Um, what other things? I have my own bio in front of me. I'm a research fellow with the Yellowhead Institute, um, and I'm really happy to be here today as um, somebody who helped uh, uh, have a look at the, the fact-checking guide in its early stages. So I am joined by, um, <laughs> for those of you in person, I know you can see, I'm joined virtually. We're, we're teasing that I've sort of got my imaginary friends, panelists here. Um, I'm joined by um, Ashton Lattimore, Megan Ashford Grooms, and Andrean Angelme. Is that right? Not, not quite, pretty close. Okay, so I'm going to let um, all of you introduce yourselves and I'm going to order it from looking at you directly. So, <laughs> I, so I'm not sure who wants to go first, but feel free to, to how about Ashton? You're the first on my list. Sure, I'm Ashton Lattimore. I'm the editor in chief of PRISM, um, which is uh, an independent nonprofit newsroom uh, led by journalists of color, where we focus on grassroots reporting from the ground up um, with the intent to shift narratives about communities of color and form movements for social justice. Miigwech, thank you. And where are you coming to us from, Ashton? I am in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. It's about 20 minutes outside of Philadelphia. Okay, great. Thank you. And Megan. Hi there. It's very strange to see myself on the screen behind you. Uh, um, so my name is Megan Ashford Grooms. I'm the deputy copy chief at Kaiser Health News, which is a journalism project that focuses on health and healthcare. Um, that's what's created by the Kaiser Family Foundation. We have people all over um, the country now and all over the United States, I should say. And um, I am based in Washington where a lot of our editorial team is, but we, like I said, we have folks all over the place. Awesome, miigwech, thanks for being here. And Andreanne. Hi, yes, uh, I'm Andreanne and I'm a PhD student in clinical psychology at Université du Québec um, at Trois-Rivières and I'm currently in um, Montreal, Quebec. Great, thank you very much. So this, um, um, such an, it's a, it's a, I'm really excited to hear that the perspectives are really sort of broad, broad range, wide range here of, of, um, of experiences um, in, in the fields of what we're talking about today is accuracy and verification in particular. And so um, I've, 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 we've, the, we've given the panelists the questions in advance, um, but also asked them to interpret as they will uh, to apply sort of to, to their own work. Um, so feel free to just answer a question, answer completely, you know, something different that I don't ask if you'd like. Um, but we're going to start with uh, talking a little bit about if you could tell us a little bit about, um, are there times when accuracy and verification processes come into conflict with other priorities or values that matter in your work? And maybe we'll go, um, we'll go left to right, my left to right now, your left to right too. So Megan, or Megan, pardon me, if you wanted to start. Sure, thank you. Um, so I um, work um, and I am, I think, the only person on this panel that works in media, um, and I've worked in journalism for many, many years, but I've also taken some uh, time outside, and I've worked a little bit in policy. Um, I worked at a think tank for a little bit um, in an editorial capacity, but with researchers, um, and I think I'm, I'm, my perspectives, I'm on this panel, I think, um, to talk a little bit about um, my time before my current employer, which is I worked for a long time at 538, which is a data journalism website. And we, because of the nature of that work, and we can talk more about that, um, the, 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 and because of the mission for that project, we ended up doing a lot of work that wasn't so typical for uh, the kinds of things that are, were being produced at other media outlets. And so we had to create a lot of systems in our, in, our, in our editorial process, including fact-checking um, that we crafted and we shaped to fit the needs of our particular newsroom, which was a, you know, that doing this niche work. And one of the 
specific sort of intentional um, uh, goals of the work at 538 was to bring more of sort of social science practices, more work on statistics, um, more uh, sort of bringing those those skills into a newsroom setting, attempting to do um, you know independent data analysis, and then also, but then the added difficulty of like and explaining that to a more general audience. Um, and this was quite intentional. And, um, you know, that created, there were a lot of tensions when, in the process of trying to um, explain, break down, clarify, speak to people who were not experts about these like extremely complicated statistical concepts, which was not a thing that um, I had spent a lot of time doing in my previous journalism work. Um, and so, you know, that was a con there was a constant battle between, you know, writing three sentences about an extremely complicated study or like an extremely complicated methodology that the writer had used, trying to uh, both serve the reader, which is that we want this to be accessible. That's the whole idea. We want you to be able to come and learn about these new things in a way without having to have a lot of um, uh, prior knowledge about this topic, but also still trying to be quite true to the important aspects of the study itself or of the methodology itself. It was really hard, you know, to both simplify and explain um, with without um, giving, you know, sort of short shrift or without sort of creating a, a question of inaccuracy um, about the source material. Yeah, that's really so. So first of all, am I, I? I feel like I'm trying very hard to not move because my mic is picking up everything. I'm just going to touch it and move it farther up. Maybe that will help. Um, I'm interested. It didn't really help. Um, that's really interesting. The, the idea of like having to create a whole new system in order to to deal with that that kind of um, data and information. How was it received in the newsroom? It was a tough transition in a lot of ways. Well, one of the things that was. Um, special about the 538 newsroom and one of the reasons we needed um, uh, some sort of like very individualized system for our newsroom was because it was a mix of people who had a lot of journalism either training or experience those were typically were the editors but the con the writers and the analysts a lot of them were coming from were not they weren't coming to us from journalism and so they didn't have that that background they didn't have that experience and so we had to put in place a lot of a lot of um, that, like we basically tried to institute what we've talked about a lot today um, is some sort of a hybrid version of a magazine style fact checking, which, you know, if you're working with people who are used to writing their own blogs or, you know, who, who were who were um, writing at a newspaper where they don't have this same internal processes <clears throat> that feels really onerous. But I think what happened is we asked everyone to show their work, we asked them to send your spreadsheet. Almost everything that we worked on, um, almost all the analyses are built on um, individual, uh, unique data analysis. And we asked people to send in everything. And we looked at everything. And on, one of the things that was interesting on my desk is we had a, we had a quant editor too, who we, um, who would, whose whole job or the majority of their job was to recreate the findings of the people, of the writers. Um, and so we we asked for all the material, much like the the, the former New Yorker head of fact checking was describing about in the last panel at his um, at that institution. We asked for everything to be accounted for. The one thing that we didn't do is we didn't call people. That was what I mean. I it's so wonderful to hear people talking uh, about that as such an important part of the process. Yes, I love it. We didn't have the ability to do that in our context, but we did ask people to provide more material than they were used to at other publications. And it was a really hard transition. Um, but I think that it worked because we showed how much, um, how, much, how much confidence they could have in the quality of their work once it went on the internet. And that really made a, a difference for us because almost all of our work was, as I said, analytical. So it was building an argument. And if you didn't do your quant work right, if you accidentally pushed the wrong button, and downloaded the wrong data set or looked at the wrong years, then your whole argument is going to be invalidated. And I think that writers, once they went through our process, really felt like once it, their work was out in the world, they could really put it up and say, "We know that this is um, this has been you know through the ringer, and we know it's right, and we feel really confident that we've done a good job." 
Awesome. Thank you, Miigwech. Um, we're going to move to Andreana and I'll just, I know you have the questions, but for also the audience reminder that we started at um, thinking about uh, any potential conflicts and priorities or values around between your field and fact checking and verification. Hi, yes. Um, so I'll briefly talk about sort of my perspective on it. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm not in journalism, but I am a, a researcher. So I'm in clinical psychology and I'll, I'll sort of talk about my experience for um, my research. So part of fact checking, I think, is uh, starts really from the, the startup of the project. So in thinking about what your research question is, and I think the framing of that research question can really um, influence the type of, of data that you're gonna get. Specifically for me, if I talk about qualitative research, um, the interview questions are also going to have an influence. So you really want to make sure that you don't have a biased perspective. I think sometimes as researcher, we're curious, we might have an idea. In mind. So to make sure that you um, um, really work hard to be as valid and as reliable with your research as you uh, can. I think with the process of qualitative research as well is um, how you want to make sure that you facilitate the interviews with participants to make sure that you're um, fact checking, I think, with them in the moment. So making sure that, you know, their story is accurately being portrayed through your research so that you might have um, to check for nuances or for things that might be confusing or might lead the research from uh, one side to another. And I think, of course, then the biggest part is how you're going to code and represent the, the research, so the data that you get. Um, interviews with participants in quality of research are, are often, you know, quite long. And then as a researcher, you have the duty to make sure that you're accurately representing the voice of and the narrative and the experience of your participant through either your quotes or uh, through your, your themes that you're um, seeing emerged in the research. I think making sure that you're, um, you have a variety of sources of information also so that you're not leading the research to go one way or another. That's part of fact checking, I think. Um, and then of course, when it gets down to publishing, you again have to diminish it even more. I think if we think about it as thesis, so if you have 15 interviews that lasted maybe two hours, you really have to distill that to enter in a thesis. And then when you think about the article that will be then published in a, a journal, you have to distill that even more. And so it really is a, a challenge, I think, sometimes to make sure that things are accurately portrayed. Um, and I think the onus is on the researcher to ensure that um, you're not letting your own perception of what the participants have shared with you, that you're also getting someone who uh, does reliability checking or fact checking. So are you getting someone else to verify the, the work that you've done? Um, are you able to take a step back? So I think those are, um, are times when sometimes the priority might be, for example, if you think about a student to, um, to finish your, your thesis quickly, but I think it's taking the time and it's a very important time that you're taking because uh, you're ensuring that the voices of your participant and that your research um, is, is a good representation of, of what you're trying to find. So I think um, really having your neutrality as a researcher, as an interviewer, um, having people who are going to code with you and having someone who might be helpful in choosing, you know, what quotes you're using and how you're using those quotes. And I think you also, there's more and more research that is, um, um, collaborating with the participants throughout the research. So when you ch you've chosen the quotes and when you've put it into context, you can share that with the participant to make sure, hey, is this an accurate description of, of what you wanted to share? And, you know, my perception of it and how I'm explaining it, do you find that it represents your experience and your voice? And I think that's fact checking with them. And, um, and it's also, you know, ensuring quality research uh, when you're doing that as well. Mm, yeah, Miigwech, and you anticipated my question. So in our, um, 
in my work, we have a, it's, just, you know, it's really just a social science methodology in, at the Indigenous Law Research Unit, but it's rooted in community and we've added sort of different steps. And one of them is a, a validation process for being able to go back and check with people about direct and indirect quotes and in the context. And, and we give people the opportunity to change what they've said, um, um, which I know is not standard practice in, <laughs> in, um, in field. So I'm wondering if in your process, if you go back, you know, if you go back to that and that, that verification process and someone's, you know, it, like there, there's an interesting line between sort of informed consent and voluntariness and, and, and say, no, I withdraw my quote as a po or what my, my, whatever I've participated in versus no, I just want to edit it a bit. Is there space in your work to do that? And, and if, and if so, or if not, actually, um, how do you think that might influence your, your research? That's a really great, great question. I think that sounds like great practice as well. Um, I think there is definitely room for that um, and you know I think it's it's important to build that relationship with participants and you have to do it in the beginning also because once something is published unfortunately you can you know you can add a note to it but uh, to maybe ensure that you're doing that with participants before I had sent my research to participants and no one um had brought that forward to want to maybe change a uh, quote, but I think, you know, I didn't suggest that. So I think that that is a, a good practice. And I, I think you're also, it's, it's making sure that the participant also in an interview, I, I mean, sometimes we can share something and then realize, you know, that might have been influenced by an emotion or uh, by the day that I was having. So I think it, it makes ensures that it's something that's um, more reliable. So I think there would be definitely room for that. Oh, great. I know, imagine being able to retract your media statement on the day you gave it when you're having a crappy day. That'd be great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, Ashton, again, just from going back to that, that uh, potential conflicts and, or, 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 or not quite alignment in values um, and priorities in the work that you're doing alongside verification and, and accuracy. Sure. Um, so at PRISM, you know, we're a media outlet where all of our journalism focuses really on marginalized communities. Um, so that's communities of color, um, immigrant communities, you know, people experiencing houselessness and so on. Um, so I think part of what we've had to kind of adapt to is the understanding that in many cases, the sort of worship of physical documentation of certain facts is just not going to be feasible. So for example, if you're, you know, writing a story that's about immigration and you're dealing primarily with undocumented people, there's not going to be some piece of paper just by definition of the premise that's going to tell you, oh yes, I have confirmed this person is undocumented or I've confirmed that this person, you know, has has no, you know, permanent address or, or whatever it kind of looks like. So I think learning to look at other kind of indicia of reliability um, as you speak with people, develop relationships with them as sources and getting to know them um, so that you can find other ways um, to verify things um, has been important, I think, to our processes. Um, and sort of getting comfortable with the fact that, you know, at a certain point, you really do have to trust your source themselves if they're sharing their lived experience with you, that it is what it is, as they say, they have experienced it because there simply just is not going to be a hard version of proof for every single possible fact that you might want to verify. Um, and I think the other piece of it, which isn't so much in conflict with our values, but just presents some interesting kind of um balancing questions um, and framing questions in a lot of stories um, is that question of lived experience, particularly when we're thinking about um, workplace stories. We cover workers' rights quite a bit at PRISM, um, and you're going to speak to, obviously, speak to workers. You're going to speak to management. And, you know, there are many cases where you are speaking to these two groups of people and based on their own perspectives, what they are saying is true. It is accurate to their experience, but they may be in direct conflict with each other, you know, in how they characterize the situation. Is this a toxic work environment? Is this not a toxic work environment? And how you choose 
to frame your story, what kind of context you put around the quotes that someone is giving you, um, I think can be, um, it can be a difficult kind of balancing question in many cases, especially when you're dealing um, with workplace stories, as we often are, where um, it's not only the workers who are from marginalized identities, you know, or, or who have some form of privilege or just the managers who have some form of privilege. So you really are assessing people's understanding of their own power dynamics and how they're showing up and how you choose to replicate them within the story or not replicate them within the story um, is um, something that kind of gets in the way a little bit of what we try not to do, which is sort of this both sides reporting where it's, well, one person said the sky is green. One person said the sky is, is blue. We don't know. Here are the quotes <laughs> from both of them here. You read or figure it out. Um, not wanting to be in the business of doing that, but at the same time, you know, really wanting to honor people's lived experiences and what they have to say about them. So just finding ways to contextualize and balance the information that people provide um, within a story um, is something that we focus a lot on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about that, you know, being able to, it's like showing a, a picture with nothing in it. It's like, I'm, look, this person is undocumented. You can see there are no papers in their hand. It's sort of, you know, proving the negative, but um, I'm wondering about, you're talking about trying not to replicate those power dynamics in, 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 in the story itself. I'm wondering about in the process as, as well, about even, you know, inquiring after people, you know, the things you might need for accuracy or verification. Is there, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so in the context of workplace story. Um, since that's that's what I was just thinking of, um, a lot of cases there is physical documentation in those instances, right? There are di disciplinary processes someone might have gone through. There are emails. There might be videos um, of recorded Zoom meetings. So we do look at all of those things um, as we're um, working our way through the story. I think what becomes kind of unverifiable to some extent is like what what was in someone's heart when they took a particular off, you know, action, what was in their head when a manager made a particular decision. So I think in terms of rep not replicating those power dynamics, I think a lot of what we do is focus on impact as we're reporting on what has happened um, in a given, a given space. So it's not so much that we are characterizing this person as, um, you know, whatever kind of negative ism that you want to attach to someone who might take a negative workplace action. But, you know, here's what, here's the decision they made. Here's the context that they made it in. Here's the documentation that we looked at that showed maybe some of the thought process that went into it. And here's the ultimate impact that it had on this person, their life, their livelihood, their ability to take care of themselves and their family. Um, and that's kind of how we structure um, things that we're taking a look at in that within that frame. And in terms of um, sort of the verification process and, and seeking kind of comment and quote from people, the order in which we do that, I think is really important because we tend to go um, to workers first before we will necessarily go to, to management. Of course, we'll give everybody, you know, ample time to respond to any kind of allegation. Um, and then also understanding people's different levels of comfort and knowledge about interacting with the media. So being a lot more descriptive of what it means to have a conversation with a reporter when we're dealing with somebody who has less of that experience than someone who's like, you know, the CEO or the executive director of a, you know, a corporation or something like that, who will be a little bit more savvy um, in that kind of scenario. Yeah, that's great. Much. Thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to the answers of the next question. What is your biggest pet peeve? when seeing facts from your um, field represented in, um, we're gonna say media, we were just having a conversation about media is actually a very large scope, so you can narrow the scope as much as you want. Um, and we'll start with um, Antrianne this time. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give a bit more context also about my research. And um, so again, mental health, obviously with clinical psychology, I think just with psychology as a whole, we can see, um, sometimes news article, you know, a cure to depression, for example, that is a big pet peeve uh, when, you know, either programs or treatment plans or uh, things are presented as, as being cures or, you know, one tea to help you boost your mood. I think things are complex and I think they can be simplified sometimes when they're presented in the media. Mental health is really complex. I think it's, um, you know, we're, we're all experiencing spectrum of, of wellness and sometimes being less well, and that is not influenced by one thing or another. So when things are simplified and seen as, you know, one thing having a big impact or having all the impact, that can be really difficult. Um, I also work with, uh, so I look at how police culture can be 
uh, detrimental to uh, women who work in policing, to men as well, sort of having restricted gender norms. And I think um, with how sometimes results can be represented in um, simplifying it, but also having sometimes resistant to it, to it and results being sometimes my own results were simplified and used in a way that, you know, was not accurately describing what I researched. I think when you do research in, in things that can sometimes be, have some pushback, then it can be um, difficult to see how it can be represented. So I think how results are taken and made into something that they're not, that would be my biggest um, pet peeve. I would say. Awesome, thank you. Um, Ashton? I think in media, um, probably my biggest pet peeve is over-reliance on what we think of as official sources, um, people who maybe are in elected office or are police, for example, um, or you know, if you're reporting on a labor story, over-reliance on managers and PR stories you know, PR representatives um, who can give you kind of the official word to the exclusion of talking to the people who are often directly impacted by the actions that these sort of official people are taking. Um, so you're, you're talking to police, but you're not talking to community members. You're talking to managers and you're not talking to workers. And then you build an entire story, an entire narrative around what you believe are the facts as they have been presented to you um, by this person who wields power and has the biases toward the status quo that may come with wielding that power. Um, and then you kind of just let the ripple effects happen from there. Um, I think you probably see the most insidious version of this, you know, with the long-term um, sort of tendency of many media outlets to kind of take police press releases um, and descriptions of what might have happened in an incident of, say, police violence against a community member. Take those press releases, take those statements and run with them as the first version of the story, only to find out what happened, you know, later may have been described initially as some kind of, a, you know, a random freak medical event that someone experienced while they happened to have some police around them as actually you know, an act of egregious violence that the police committed and then just simply chose not to describe that way for reasons that I'm, I'm sure are, are fairly obvious to all of us. Um, so having kind of that background knowledge um, in media, it's pretty widespread, pretty widely known at this point, but seeing so many outlets be so slow to question their over-reliance on official sources um, is a big pet peeve of mine. Mm, yeah, miigwech, thank you. Um, and Megan. Slow to unmute, sorry guys. Also, I just wanted to say, I'm gonna fact check myself from earlier in the conversation. Ashton, I owe you an apology. I don't know why I said that I was the only person from media on the panel. I think I got stuck the, with the across disciplines in the um, in the title. So I'm really sorry about that. That's That was oh, my bad. Um, so uh, pet peeves uh, for me, so from the perspective of this sort of data journalism world, um, I'm gonna have two answers. So I'm gonna have one from the data journalism world and one from sort of looking at journalism a little bit more broadly. Um, I would say that from that perspective, um, so for example, uh, this is similar to what Andrian, And Andrian said earlier about um, simplifying things that maybe need to, in which nuance or uncertainty needs to be better communicated. That's really hard to get right in media. Um, and at 538, we <clears throat> had developed over time some really great best practices about writing about polling, specifically political polling. That was kind of our, our bread and butter um, issue, as I think many people probably know. Um, and it was really hard to watch. It has been harder. People have gotten better in a lot of really, um, really big national media outlets in the US have invested um, in a lot of new expertise in their newsrooms. And it's really awesome. But for a while there, it, it had, you know, it was frustrating to watch people write big stories about a single poll when we know in best practice that you shouldn't just talk about one, that averages are more important. And some of those other things that, um, that we really tried to like put forward in our work and try to make some change in that space within journalism, but it's, it's a hard, it's a hard road to hoe. Um, so then uh, my broader uh, response would be um, my current pet peeve is about um, trend stories sort of in any context um, that don't uh, have sort of the proper evidence uh, in their in up uh, presented within the body of the piece themselves to justify uh, telling your reader that this is happening 
on a large scale. Um, that, of course, can be problematic for a lot of the reasons that we all know. And, and this is not uh, specific just to, I wouldn't say this is for every topic or every issue, but um, I do still feel like the mainstream media has a tendency to um, talk to two people and then be like, this is happening, this is a big deal thing. Um, and I think that we should have higher standards um, in, for um, telling people that uh, something is a trend. We need to operationalize and define trend. <laughs> Um, awesome, Miigwech. I just, as I'm looking at this next question, it feels very, I'm kind of meta and existential. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And we're going to start with Ashton. Uh, essentially talking about definitions and operationalizing accuracy and verification. What, how, tell, tell, how would you define those? What do those mean to you in the, in the, in the work of Jane? Sorry, again, I know as I'm saying it, I'm like, what a ridiculous question, Tara. <laughs> so operationalizing, um, accuracy um gosh that's that's a tough question it does feel very meta even though i've sort of thought yeah. about it before, <laughs> before our conversation but um as i was saying earlier i think some of it is like looking for indicia of reliability when you're speaking to people so you know um developing kind of a sense of whether or not your sources are reliable as human beings and some of that is relationship building you know over time if you're um, talking to someone not just for a story but because you've developed kind of an ongoing dialogue with them i think um that's one of the ways that i think we sort of operationalize um building mutual trust right because we want them to trust us as an outlet that they can bring their story to and at the same time we want to be able to trust them and so in turn um in terms of like the the sources and the facts that they're bringing to us so I think relationship building is, is really, really crucial. Um, and that's just sort of how we think about um, as a news outlet, being in community with the folks that we are um, reporting with and reporting on. So it's not so much we're coming top down um, into this community that we know nothing about. And we're, kind of, we're trying to pull and extract facts from the people that we're talking to, but we're sort of building relationships and building trust over time. Um, and in that way, we can sort of learn who's reliable and who you know might not be um, or what you know, what entities or organizations might be um, useful places to, to gain information and to learn more, uh, whereas other people, you know, might be in, um, impacted by other biases that they might have. Um, and I think some of that is also um, going back to what I was talking about with my pet peeve, just thinking about the way that you view different institutions, where are these facts coming from? Are they coming from somebody who is directly impacted by the issue that you're talking about? Are they coming from a researcher who may have a bird's eye view of this issue that's going to sound and look a little bit different um, than somebody who's sort of directly on the ground and having it happen to them? One is not necessarily going to be more accurate than the other, and you can put them next to one another um, as context for each other. Um, but thinking about where information is coming from um, and how you you want to sort of value and prioritize those in your um, verification processes um, for us is crucial. And we do tend to sort of privilege direct lived experience when we're thinking about what we want to have as our baseline set of facts. Awesome. Thank you, Miigwech. Um, Megan? Sure. Yes. So um, I'm going to, this question made me think about something that was talked about in the earlier um, panel, which was that, so I work currently as a copy editor um, and I've, al I've always worked in newsrooms where they did not have separate, a separate fact-checking unit. So I, um, fact-checking happens in sort of more, in, in more newspaper style fact-checking newsrooms, the fact-checking happens if it happens at all out outside of the reporter process. The reporters are, you know, responsible for checking their facts. And then the copy desk kind of acts as a backstop. Um, but at 538, it, you know, in sort of what we think of as, as um, standard fact checking can be like, is this number correct? Did you find that, you know, did you find this in a place what we think is a, is a worthwhile source? Did you spell this person's name right? And that's all very important. And I, I do that now and, and all of my team has done that. And I think that has really a lot of value. But what was interesting at 538 is that our team really um, also had to uh, think bigger picture about the claims that were being made as the point of the piece. What is this piece of analysis? It's, it's used all this data, there's all these different sources, but most of the time our pieces were more like an opinion article in the sense that they're using all of that to come together and tell you something um, about the world um, based on all the evidence that's being presented. And so 
um, verification in that case became a little bit more complicated because it was like, okay, yeah, I can go through your entire piece and I see that you have used, you have all the individual components right in your piece, but I'm not sure that these things come together and really support your overall argument in the way, it, it, in a way that we feel comfortable about publishing. And, you know, that is a very hard, um, that's, it's very difficult to kind of tell, talk to people about that you know step in the process and it's it's hard to work um, with both editors and writers to try to get that piece um, as sort of accurate as possible because obviously it's there's a lot of subjectivity in in who you're working with who what the writer thinks they may disagree with you um, so I think very verification can be in those sort of argument based pieces um, a pretty fraught uh, area, but I think, you know, it's an also a really interesting area where people can come together and like, look at the same information, come to different uh, conclusions, and then also sort of find a, a, a compromise place. And that's where the piece kind of, that's how the piece is kind of born into the world. Yeah, that's inter it's interesting. I'm learning a lot about um, sort of the role of, 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 of journalism in particular around, you know, forming arguments and just thinking about building a case in law and that, that what you're saying that, you know, it's a sort of similar thinking that, you know, A plus B plus C plus, you know, you can get from one to one to one, but you don't necessarily arrive at E like A to D could all be individually accurate, but the, the, the whole does not reflect the sum of the parts kind of deal. So it's, yeah. it's I'm learning a lot about, <laughs> about some of these similarities. So we glad to thank you. Um, Andreanne. Uh, yeah, so I really loved when Ashton, you put it as relationship building. I think even, you know, when we do interviews, taking the time when you're um, interviewing participants to make sure that your understanding is an accurate description. I think that happens, you know, in, in real time. You want to do that, of course, when you're writing up the results, but I think you want to do it when you're taking the time with the participants. So either summarizing the understanding that you've had or uh, your reflection on it and seeing where that leads the participant or where um, that might lead the reflection also. Um, I think that for me is a part of verification. So just verifying with them that we're accurately understanding and representing their narrative. I think also when um, in terms of accuracy, I know when I presented my data, having in mind that we are, you know, there is always subjectivity with it. And I think I had a, a part in my, um, in my thesis of self-reflexivity. So where did I come from when I started this project? Where, um, what role do I have inevitably in, in my research in the interviews and in the representation of it? Um, I think that's trying to make it as accurate as possible that I am an active agent in, in this. And I'm trying to make it as neutral as possible, but you know, um, that's also something to keep in mind. And then having someone else, like I've mentioned, so a mentor or a colleague that um, can be neutral and help you make sure that you're accurately representing um, what you're what you're trying to answer as your question. Awesome, Gwetch, thank you. Yeah, having outside eyes is really such a, an important part and a gift. All right, this is the last question and we'll, we'll open it up to, to, to questions from others. Um, what competencies do you think are most important for journalists to possess in order to sort of get to the heart of accuracy in their reporting? And we're gonna go back to start with Megan. Sorry, I should give you an advance notice. You can unmute. No, no, that's okay. Sorry, I'm slow at the, at the muting. Um, so I think, again, speaking from my um, experience with data journalism, um, I, well, let me step back. I think, um, unfortunately, media, it's so fast paced. Everybody's working so hard. They're usually juggling a bunch of different stories, whether that's as an editor or as a writer. And we just don't have enough time for training. I've worked in lots of newsrooms and I feel like, um, Sometimes uh, we end up with um, people working on like quite complicated um, topics with and and without the uh, either uh, you know the support in advance to sort of do their to do their best work. And so um, from that sort of data journalism perspective, I I wish um, I think training about how to read a scientific study um, is something that I would like to see happen more. But also um, and I think this speaks to 
sort of um, the, the media trying to be a better like arbiter of what's quality information is we also need to know in the newsroom what, what studies, whether they're good studies. Like we, like we don't have a lot of um, knowledge about like, let's read this methodology and decide whether or not we really wanna use this in, in this important piece that we're writing. Um, Cause studies are all over uh, journalism now, you know, one sentence at a time. Um, and so I think, I think that's something that could be super valuable from that data journalism um, perspective. Um, but again, I will say that uh, the big ju- journal, the big newsrooms have really invested in this area a lot in the last few um, years. And so that's really great. What it would be great is if we could get some of that training, you know, and that those, ex- that expertise and skill set out into, you know, other, you know, smaller newsrooms, um, medium sized newsrooms, because, um, you know, we want people to be able to use as many tools as they can get their hands on to, to process the world and tell us about what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, miigwech. Thank you. Um, you guys probably know the order by now. Andrean. <laughs> um, yeah, the first thing that came into my mind, which I think, you know, uh, journalists, I'm sure do have, but I don't know if it's a competency, but I would say it's critical thinking. And I think to be able to think critically about what you are um, Rep, what you are depicting or what you are um, reporting on, I think that's super important, even if it might speak to you, um, you might be pro or against it. I think being critical of it um, from the start is very important. Also being humble and my biggest thing I think with media is to not want to sensationalize whatever you're, you're reporting. So to make sure that you're taking the time, it might not be a headline that's as, um, that shines as much and that leads the, leads people to click on it the most, but it's going to be a better representation then of, of what you're presenting. So taking the time, I think, um, in when you're writing it, when you're presenting it and being critical with the material that you're uh, p- reporting on as well, I think would be competencies that would be important. Awesome. Thank you, Miigwech. And Ashton. Sure, I think um, one of the most crucial competencies in journalism um, is to have some sense of societal um, power dynamics, to have some understanding of how they function and how the, the intervention of journalism is going to impact them. Because I think far too often journalists, we may think of ourselves as sort of detached observers. You know, we're out here kind of with the camera, like in a nature documentary, we're not getting involved, we're just observing. Um, but in reality, the decision uh, of who you choose as your sources, who you choose to trust, what information you choose to uplift that's an intervention that's going to have a direct impact on the power dynamics that you are observing and intervening in. So how you choose to use the tool of journalism and the impact that you're trying to have with each, with each story, I think is something that it's really important for journalists to be um, conscious of at a very, very sort of intentional level. Yeah, awesome, Miigwech. Thank you. I know in... Um... Uh, many indigenous communities, you know, whether or not you're, you're sourced anonymously, like it, it really is the actual it, physical intervention of speaking to a journalist itself has implications, right, that resonate, whether or not that's published or anything else. So I appreciate that, thinking about that right at the ground level. I think there are so many questions. Um, so I don't know what to do about that. Is somebody in charge of that? Am I in charge of that? Is there, I just don't, does somebody tell me if they're Zoom people? Okay, great. So we have this question over here right away. Thank you. Zoom people. <laughs> Hi. Um, I guess this is working. Yeah. Um, so my question is uh, about consensus. Um, I'd argue that uh, a lot of the major issues, not all, but a lot of the major issues facing our you know, the, the question of, of humanity at this point are scientifically based like climate change or, um, you know, the value of vaccines. Um, and uh, obviously the media has been, uh, had a poor role to play in creating false balance that led to, for example, vax hesitancy um, being presented as, you know, something um, that had scientific merit or for example, climate change being, you know, not a, you know, a consensus of most environmental scientists. Okay, so my question is though, how do you determine 
when there's scientific consensus in order to say, you know, this is a, a fact, this is where all the scientists agree, when um, also some really great stories are out there are when scientists disagree, when there isn't consensus. And so, yeah, we're, I guess my question is, how do you walk that, that fence? Um, how do you also determine, you know, that, you know, 98% of all scientists believe X or Y um, in order to avoid that false balance um, or in order to support a story that actually is unveiling something controversial in the scientific field. So, and, and I would guess that that issue exists everywhere, but particularly in science where I think most people think facts are facts, science is like very, like no scientist will say we know conclusively X or Y. They will not say that. They will say we think, and they'll couch it because science is actually a consensus field, not a, not truly a, you know, un, you know, clear fact field. Okay, sorry, I won't talk longer. I'm, I'm gonna take it as you see fit. I'm sure you can <laughs> govern yourselves accordingly. A small thought that I can kick off this answer with, which is that, um, for example, um, the example that you used about climate change, uh, that was a real, that was not a shining moment for media in the, we had to like kind of watch painfully as, um, as outlets got to that point. And it was all obviously very public. I would argue, and I, and I wasn't, you know, this, this is just my opinion ba my, based on my experience, but I think that beat reporting on these topic, on these very important topics and having journalists that are dedicated to them. So that means that they spend all their time reading things about these different areas, having ongoing conversations with sources so that they really know much, that they know well what the conversation is ab among the scientists so that they can bring that to, the, they can have that expertise within their institution. And I imagine, I don't know this for sure, this is just speculation, but I fear that some of the, what happened with climate change is that we didn't have people that we're spending a lot of their time thinking about these things. Now we do. That's obviously a topic that is high that is high priority for all the major news organizations in the U.S. Um, but I but I do think that that if if media can dedicate people to certain topics that that where this there's a potential for this to happen, then I think we can. Media is always probably going to follow a little bit, um, but hopefully we can catch up faster. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, great. So do, do Ashton or um, Andrean want to want to answer that or address that at all? I just mostly just agree in, in emphatic terms. <laughs> um, I think expertise is so incredibly um, important uh, within the journalistic space. And I worry sometimes that it can be devalued because the, the closer you get to a topic, the more people start to worry that you'll form an opinion about it or form biases about it to the point where expertise itself or being close to a topic um, starts to look suspicious. And I think that's something that kind of collectively we need to move away from as an industry, this idea that people um, caring too much about a particular issue, or maybe even having some sort of personal involvement or personal attachment to a subject matter, um, would, would be a reason why they shouldn't be kind of a trusted source or even a trusted reporter to do, to do a story on it. Um, that's going to be, you know, increasingly true with things like climate, where there are going to be people who are directly in, impacted by, by climate disasters, for example, who may also be journalists. And that, that may be the thing that sparks them to develop an expertise in that area. And I think that um, kind of honoring that level of expertise and interest rather than fearing it um, would be a, a definite step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I just want to piggyback on that because that's a really big de like debated topic in media right now. And I just want to say that that I don't think people talk enough about it's not the it's not the person, it's the work. And like that's where you need to if if, if there's gonna be um, an issue of bias or an addition issue of um, someone becoming too close to their sources or something that's going to, that's the, the way you find that out is what they're producing, not who they are. And I, I think that that's not a part of the conversation enough, especially on Twitter. Yeah, dude, especially on Twitter. Um, yes. And sort of reflecting from this morning's uh, keynote about, you know, objectivity and transparency and, and, you know, objectivity, not as the lack of bias or as a lack of opinion or right. That if you're transparent about your process and, 
Zoom. We have Zoom. I'm waiting for the disembodied voice. Oh, there's a body of the voice. There's a head with the voice. That's wonderful. Hello. I, ha I have a face, exactly. Um, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. First of all, thank you guys very much. Um, everything so far has been extremely interesting. And I, I'm wondering if I perhaps should have asked this question to the previous panel, but I think you guys will probably have some thoughts as well, too. So I'm a former journalist who now works in communications, specifically in the court system. Uh, we're hearing a lot about what journalists and writers can do to fact check and verify whether pieces or whether they're accurate and properly reflect the experiences of the people they've interviewed. But obviously, in the case of court proceedings, um, it's not necessarily practical to have journalists talk to say the witnesses about their testimony. Or if lawyers aren't making themselves accessible outside of court, how is it that you're you're verifying that your account of the proceedings is in fact accurate or 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 correct in the facts. And of course, with uh, with court two, we know that um, the, the facts are often disputed and very different depending on who you're speaking with. So I'd be interested to know your thoughts, if there's any advice for journalists in particular who are covering um, legal matters and, and court proceedings. I know Ashton described themselves as a recovery lawyer, I think. Is that right? <laughs> Covering largely recovered, but I, I can do oh, that good, good. a little bit too. <laughs> um, I think what's useful in that context where it is a like a trial or something where the facts are very much in dispute, um, I think the most accurate way to report something like that is is as a dispute, um, if that's if that's fair, like that that's the that's the story. Um, so it's not so much for the reporter to kind of take on the role of the jury in that case to describe to decide for for the reader, you know, what is an actual accurate depiction of, of what happened. Um, but at the same time, I don't think you you know as a reporter need to like turn off all of your senses. So if there is a witness who you know for in, in some way is, is maybe caught in cross examination and has lied a bunch of times, I think that's totally fine. To put that in the story as well. But yeah, I think um, in that particular case, situating the story within its context, which is that that it's very at very core, it is a dispute, um, probably goes a long way. Um, I would hope to making sure that whatever report is coming out um, is accurate. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think um, the other thing that I that I that comes to mind for me when you're thinking through this is that it's also very important for journalists to say what they don't know. And I think that there's sometimes there's a lot of pushback. There can be pushback um, in certain editorial contexts for that. And I, I, I grew up in a new, in like a mid-sized newsroom in the U S during a period where there was a lot of excitement about sort of narrative nonfiction. And there was a lot of emphasis on narrative and I think that sometimes that can be great when we, when we have deeply, report, when we've done, been able to do deep reporting, but the kind of situation that you're talking about is like, I personally don't think that's an appropriate um, type of story to tell from this like very narrative perspective where you're not necessarily understanding like who gave you that piece of information um, or, or what document that came from or or what holes there are in the in the particular narrative about that. I am a kind of like full transparency person at all times. That doesn't always make for beautiful prose, but I think it serves the reader better when they know why it is that you're reporting something in a certain way and, and where you got that information. Because that right away, your editor will be able to see who you haven't talked to. So it's like, if you have not talked to the family of the victim of who, you know, if that's a, in a particular court case, you know, that's obviously a problem. And, and if you can't because of, um, because of logistical constraints or they're not willing to talk, you know, you have to tell your reader that very openly and clearly. And sometimes that's not very beautiful to read, but I think it's really important towards your journal for your journalism to do that. Thank you. I think we maybe have time for one more question. Is that right? Yeah. Is, do we have any? Do we have any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. I'm like taking over. No, you get to ask a question at the conference you organize. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually. I wanted to ask you a question. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, which obviously other people can answer as well. But I'm. I'm really curious now um, how this relates to your own work and how, oh. having heard everyone else's answers, um, you also think about accuracy and verification when working with communities as opposed to individuals um, and when working on like oral history? Oof, I was not prepared to answer a question. Um, 
you know, I was, I was just, we were joking. I'm, I'm on this conference trip right now. And so the last conference I was at was at the indigenous bar association uh, presenting on sort of the future of indigenous law and, and, and the, the questions that, that come up, including um, what is indigenous law? Where's the, like, when, when does it, when does it, Trend, you know, cross does does is there a line that it crosses where it goes from from classifying it as just a story to an amalgamation to an analysis to deliberation to like where's all those spaces, and um and when you're using um so our our work we 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 use many resources of law but stories and Ilru is particularly known for a, a story method that of analysis that we use. Um, is that if you're familiar at all with oral histories, whether they're experiential, because we will use lived experience or, or traditional stories that are orally passed down or even written down, um, there isn't, uh, like, like I think when Negan was talking about it yesterday about truth, <laughs> you know, you can, you, can have the, you can have five versions of what's almost the same story, or you can have, you know, we're, we're also looking at people's interpretations of those stories. And so um, I was asked a similar question, which is the only reason I have a, some thought on it at this moment, um, was essentially what happens when your sources conflict, and, and how do you consider conflicting sources and in, um, in stories and people's interpretations of stories. And so, so far, it's, I think it's going back to transparency. So far, what we do is essentially say, here's what we've heard. Here are the places which in our analysis and the framework we've created, where it looks like these things are saying different things. However, here are the points where they meet. And so what we can do is give you a framework and analysis based on these points of meeting and then pose questions for you know, next steps or questions that we need to consider of the places where they diverge. And that's sort of the best we can do right now, <laughs> um, and, and specifically around oral histories. And then of course, again, we you know the validation process um, later on in our methodology where we go back and we say, is this, an accurate representation of what you said or of an interpretation. And let's be very clear, usually the first time we go back and do that, not usually, but like we get told no a lot, <laughs> right? Like, and that's again, the relationship building and part of that process. And I think the, the, um, the other piece maybe that comes up around our work is time, is that I have the benefit of a project lasts two to three years. I, like, I don't know how long you, what's the, I don't know, what's the longest time somebody might work on an investigative piece? Because I imagine that's probably, the, is that the most in-depth piece of journal, you know? Like how long, what would be the longest? It could be years. Okay, but you, you, but you don't go into it thinking like, I hope I get to do this for three years. Like, right. Okay, so, so like I know, yeah, exactly. Okay, so I know at the outset that this is going to take time. So by the time the, the you know, asking a question about act, that trust, that relationship building to get to the point where, okay, we can say it's, you know, we, we approve it. We can say it's accurate enough or, or whatever, because we've known you this whole time and, and we've taught you and guided you along. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I think that I don't know what time it is because my computer turned off, but I think it must be. It's 2.30. You're perfectly on time. <laughs> of course I am. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank all of the panelists, uh, Ashton, uh, Andrean, and, and Megan, and of course, Tara, so much for moderating. Um, we're going to take a 15-minute break, um, and then we'll be back for the um, informed consent in, in journalism panel, uh, moderated by Simon Lucent. Uh, so yeah, we'll be back in 15 minutes.